This is Leroy Van Dyke, the auctioneer. <laughs> Welcome to CRS, Mr. Auctioneer. Oh, well, thank you. And as you mentioned just before, this is your uh, 59th anniversary in the industry. Yes, yes. What was, what very first, 59 years ago, what drew you to being a part of this? It started long before that. Um, when I was 13 years old, I, I grew up on a ranch. My dad was a pretty good sized farmer and ran a truck line and we were hauling a load of corn on a hot day and he, I was about half asleep riding in that old truck. He said, what would you like to do for a living? And I woke up, what, what's he getting at? And I said, well, I guess I'll be a farmer like you. He said, you might want to get that out of your mind. I said, why? He said, there might be something you'll like better that would be better for you. Then he paused and he said, if you could do anything in the world you wanted to do, what would you do? And I thought he'd put me in an insane asylum <laughs> because I said, I'd like to sing for a living. And rather than being negative, he said, you can do it. So that's where it started when I was 13 years old. Then I thought about it for a few years and I had pretty much put it on the back burner. Uh, I knew that uh, instinctively, I knew it was a tough business and difficult to get in and even dif more difficult to stay in. I don't know why I knew that, but I did. Then I went to college, finished college, went to the army and the song Auctioneer just started coming to me out of the air. It's a true story about a real person named Ray Sims, the best purebred livestock auctioneer that ever walked. He's a second cousin of mine, and he passed away about two years ago at age 90. So that's where the song came from, and it, it was just an evolutionary thing that developed without any conscious effort. The song just came to me. I didn't say I was going to write a song. It just came out of the air, and I wrote it down. Um, and that's how the whole thing started. Came back and entered a talent contest and lost. But before I got out of the studio, the phone was ringing. Within two weeks, I had a record out. Within three months, I'd sold a million records. Wow. And now it sold something like three million. So <laughs> you know, some things happen in your life that you can't control. And you don't know where they come from. I still don't know where it came from. Yeah. Because I was not a songwriter. I was good in English. Um, in all of my English classes and everything I did very well and my major in college was animal science and journalism so, but I was not a songwriter but I became one by almost no I want to say by accident but it's no it, 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 it was just by, by some un, unknown reason some yeah. some force put it in my mind and and I put it on paper I like that when you said you know I thought my dad might put me in an insane asylum oh. and I thought well you know, the music industry kind of is an insane Well, you, you got to understand, I'm older than most of the people that come see you. Uh, I'm 85 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the, the, the Depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agricultural setting in the Depression, it was a whole different lifestyle than today. <laughs> and to think that somebody, would, some kid, 13 years old, would say, I want to be in show business, I want to sing songs for a living, you got to be crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. The... The auctioneer is a song that I've, that gets covered a lot. You know, I've, yeah. I've seen a lot of people play that, and I've of, seen it go really wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> most of them go wrong, but they, they, because they don't know what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. You don't have to be an auctioneer to do it, but it helps. I, I went to auction school when I was a after my junior year of college, but a lot of a lot of them take the time to meticulously yeah. go through it and get it right, but most of them don't. Yeah, is that something? Have you have you watched this happen too? Oh, have sure, sure, I've seen it. Yeah, and is that. What, what does that does that bring up in you when you um, watch people after the, all this time still play a song that you wrote all those well, years it, ago? It, um, it makes me feel humble, really, to think that you did something that affected other people's lives. When that song became a hit, it became the anthem of all auctioneers, all English-speaking auctioneers around the world, and some who didn't speak English. And it probably still is. It, it is. It's the national, it's the international anthem of all auctioneers. And and uh, immediately after the song became a hit, the enrollment in auction schools just about doubled. It, it did one of two or three things. It either uh, sent them to auction schools to learn more, 
auction school to learn more, or they were auctioneers trying to learn it, trying to be an auctioneer, and they learned something about the bid calling process, or it, or they listened to the song enough that they became an auctioneer. That's happened to a lot of them. So that song literally changed lives. Though. Changed lots of lives, yeah. I I was at the uh, Wisconsin State Fair. A guy in a big black hat came up to me and he said, I want to shake your hands. I said, why? He said, you made me a million dollars. I said, how did I make you a million dollars? He said, I learned to call bids off of your record, and now I'm a very successful auctioneer. That's one of thousands wow, of them that have said that. Yeah. And that's almost, would you say when something like that happens, when a song affects change in somebody's life like that, that's almost the highest honor you can get? It is. Yeah. It affected people's lives in a positive manner. Uh, and I went for, th this started happening within a couple of years after I got in the business. Uh, people talking about the effect uh, the, the song had on, on their lives and how people were inspired to be auctioneers. And some of them would go to auction school and not know enough to do a, an auction and uh, needed more help. So I wrote a home study course in auctioneering. And we sold it all over the world, and it's helping a lot of people. Wonderful. That's yeah. so cool. I love that song. Yeah. The, the other song that, you know, simply have to touch on is Walk On By. Yeah, you better touch on what it. a great, <laughs> great track. And, and I think it's, it's one of those songs, even if people might not know that they know it, you know, like uh -huh. you might bring it up and they go, oh, I don't know if I know that song. And you start playing it and then go, they oh, know. of course I know this well, song. And, and of course, I was, that was a smart answer I gave you, you better think. But it... It did two or three things. Auctioneer sold millions, but it was on a label that didn't know what to do with, to do with me. So I went up like a rocket and down like a rock, career-wise. Mm -hmm. And I went through four more years with nothing happening recording. So I asked for a release from the label, which they gave me, and I didn't have anybody to turn to. So I started talking to other record companies, got a deal with Mercury Records, and Walk On By was my second record. And uh, it had an unusual thing happen to it. Uh, a few years ago, Billboard magazine did some research trying to figure out the top 100 uh, singles in country music. They spent a year researching, digging up numbers and counting beans. <laughs> and uh, they determined that based on record sales, number of, uh, number of sold, number of plays and the number of weeks in the charts that walk on by was the biggest country single of all time wow. and that's an humbling thought yeah. um, and it's better than getting entertainer of the year because the record will never be broken and i think entertainer of the year too like those awards are one-time things this proves longevity yeah longevity and and the and the records the, the 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 voting is sometimes a little political this is not political this is counting numbers yeah over a long time uh, tallying it but up and it stayed yeah. it wasn't just a part of people's lives for you know two or three years it was yeah. a part of for it's all been, of that time. it's been 58 and a half years and and the other thing is that there'll, there'll never be one to beat it because they don't stay in the charts that long. Exactly. This was in the charts for 42 weeks. Yeah. Uh, number now one number one for 19 weeks. So uh, there's a big element of luck in this business. And, and that yeah. was a big stroke of luck for me to, to find that song before somebody else got it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't finished when we found it. Uh, I had to tweak it a little bit. And then the publisher took it home and wrote the whole second verse to it. Because the writer ran out of gas, he couldn't think of any, he, he, he couldn't think of anything to to, to finish. Yeah, yeah. He, he couldn't think of anything to put in the second verse. So cool. there, there's so many possibly negative elements of that that it's a wonder it happened at all. After all of this time, all these hits, the, the everything you've seen, you're still passionate about this. You're oh yeah, excited about yeah. This. What still drives you? What do you feel you still need out of music that makes you... I don't know. Not it, want to it, just it, retire it, and it, it, No, I'm not going to hang it up. Uh, everybody that doesn't know me said, when are you going to retire? And I said, my idea of retirement is when I fall over on stage. I'm not going to retire. As long as I can sing songs and tell stories and travel and get paid for it, I'm going to do it. Um, and, and sometimes you go through life and you wonder, what am I doing here? 
what what's my purpose in being here? And the, the preachers can't tell you why you're here. And the priests can't tell you why you're here. And the rabbis can't tell you why you're here. Everybody has to figure that out. I finally figured it out. We're here to to help people with like the auction thing or or if the songs impacted somebody's life, if it made them happy, if it made them nostalgic, then that's our purpose. And that's why it took me a long time to figure that out, but that's my take on it. No, I like that. And I think yeah. it's the, it's almost for everything, whichever career you choose, if you can affect other people's lives. Positively, yeah. And, and the other thing, we, one thing that we've been doing now for a couple of decades is the Country Gold Tour. It's uh, the brainchild of my wife. She manages all of our business. Uh, it's a country gold package show made up of classic performers that have had million seller records or a whole handful of uh, number ones or in a, some occasions somebody that's so good you can't ignore them. It's called Country Gold Tour. And we've had those shows anywhere from one to 10 on the stage with me. My band backs them all. I open my, the show, mm-hmm. and and the reason I'm mentioning all this, after the show, we don't hide from anybody. We don't run for a bus. We don't have armed guards. Most of the time, we don't even have security. We don't need it because nobody's going to hurt us. Yeah. And and after the show, say we have six or eight people on the show, and we might just have two with me or one besides myself, or we might have as many as ten or eleven. But is, say we have eight people on the show, we'll put tables down there in front of the stage, and we stay there and take a, uh, sign autographs and take pictures with them as long as they want to stay. It's a giant meet and greet. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the effect that we have on people, they come down to those tables with tears in their eyes l- like a Billy Graham crusade, like an altar call at a B- Billy Graham crusade. Mm-hmm. Tears in their actually, because they see people they never thought they'd get to meet. Or they see people they saw 40 or 50 years ago, never thought they'd see them again. They actually come down to those tables with tears in their eyes. And that's our purpose in life, to make them happy. Yeah. Do you think, as you're talking about these things, I think a lot of that has sadly been a bit lost from modern country. Um, Both radio, Mm -hmm. um, the more... The older songs aren't really on the playlists anymore. No. And the bigger artists, even though country often still markets itself as the only genre that got a real close connection between artists and fans, Mm -hmm. as you just alluded to, if you go to the big shows, you have the team of security surrounding the artist, and then they go to the bus, and they're heading away. Exactly. um, Do you think that's part of why those tours are connecting with people so much? It's something they still hunger for? Oh, sure. They do. Um, I, I think the... The classic country music fans in general are the older, older portion of the population. And it's the most underserved segment of the demographics in this country because we, they don't play, most of the stations don't play that much classic country. But uh, there's a, there is a lot more going on in country music than most people know. There are people, my, my wife has become probably the biggest buyer of classic country acts in the, in the United States. She she books the country gold shows and she books other acts. Uh, besides that, she also is the uh, buyer, talent buyer for three casinos. And uh, we have found that there's a lot going on in this business. And if you go to book somebody for a show, you better call them soon because they're they're all working. They're busy. They're all busy. That's good. More busier than most people think they are. Yeah. The, this may be a, a slightly deeper question, but I'm wondering, as you're saying, it's the most underserved segment of society. Do you think that says something about society that as people get past the age of 65, they're they're almost they become a little bit more invisible? Maybe, but but that's a, a, a that's a misconception because the people that come to our shows have money to spend, and the whole thing is money based. Uh, and there, there is an element as they get older they do lose interest to a degree because they're impaired physically to the point where they can't get out at five below zero and go to a show they better not but they might not get there yeah. or in the summertime it may be too hot for them to go to a county fair that, that does affect it sure but I, I sort of and also 
the other side of that is how society views aging. Um, and I have friends out in LA and they're like, you know, aging is considered a disease out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something you want to avoid. And I think, no, yeah. it, it's when you gain the experience. I love talking to people who have lived a really great life because mm-hmm. they have the stories, they have the wisdom to pass on. And I think we're part of a society that still favors youth mm-hmm. in every way. Um, and I wonder if that's something... That, that might be an element. That, uh, that's part of that. Yeah. That's why they're not catering to an older audience because... Mm-hmm. They're too busy trying to get that demographic. Well, there's another harsh angle of it. it it's yeah. not philosophical. It's just about money. If you go to, if you have a country gold show, one of our country gold shows at a county fair, uh, they'll sell a lot of Pepsi Cola. They won't sell any beer. <laughs> not, not to our yeah. demographics. They won't sell any beer. And and these days, uh, with, with a big a big show of new country, they'll sell more beer than you pay the act, and that's, it, it boils down to money. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, what I see now is the past few years, country music has been very big and bold. And oh, yeah. One thing, but it we feel it tipping, and many people have commented on it this week. It is going back to. People are again hungering for authenticity. And mm-hmm. they, they want that real thing again. I feel that a little bit. Uh, it hasn't been manifested too much yet. But I do know a, a lot of stations are coming back to maybe not a full-time classic country format, but at least putting on a couple of hours on the right. weekends or something. Um, and it's still working. I mean, it, it, it's, a it's working. Can walk on by, yeah. That can be played 100 years from now, and it'll yeah. still be relevant. Probably, and auctioneer still plays. Yeah, there still be auctions you, going. You, on. you go to, you go to any ranch country in, in Nebraska or South Dakota or Montana or Wyoming. I, I'm not. I'm serious about this. To a county fair, and you play auctioneer. Those little kids know it. No, because they've been around cattle sales and horse sales. They know exactly what that is. Even the little kids. Yeah. What do you still strive for? So now you're you're building the country gold. What are what are the goals that you're wanting to like? Maybe not just this year, but in the next couple of years. What well, are the things that you'd like to achieve? An, an amplification of that. Uh, I've I've done about everything there is in in 58 and a half years. Seriously, I don't mean that braggingly, but no, it's just true. I, you know, I, I've done I've I've had radio shows and television shows. I've tra- traveled all over the world. Uh, I've done a, a movie and. Uh, Played the played the strip in Las Vegas. I played in New York. I played in Bastrop, Louisiana. Uh, and so the answer to that is, I just want to do more of the same. But a, a, as a career progresses, um, it's like chasing a rabbit. You you have to adapt to whatever direction the rabbit goes if you're going to catch the rabbit. Yeah. And so that's what we do. We we have to reinvent ourselves. I know when I first started, there was not much sophistication in in country music, and I noticed that somebody like Pee Wee King would write a song called Tennessee Waltz and maybe sell 75,000 records of it. Patti Page recorded the same song. She sold nine million. And in the big show sh- showcases all over the country, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, whose name was in lights? Patti Page. Yeah. Uh, Ray Price would create a hit and sell 75 or 100,000 records on Columbia Records. Then somebody like Guy Mitchell would cover the song. He'd sell millions, and his name was in lights up and down the strip in Las Vegas. And I figured that if our music is good enough go, to go there, we should be far enough along professionally to take it there ourselves and not have somebody else take it away from us and take it there. So we put together a stage-produced, self, self-contained, self choreographed show. And we were the first to take that kind of a show into the Strip in Las Vegas with country music. And it worked. Yeah. And it develops a reputation for your show. So that, that was one direction the rabbit took a turn, so I followed it. And then as time goes on, there are other ways of marketing. And, and right now we're marketing classic country very successfully. And we've had these shows in many, many states and yeah. some foreign countries. And, the, and it works. And I think it'll continue to work. I think it's, I it's so. something that people will always want, the stories, that connection. Yes. 
that's never going to go. And away. they'll always want to come down to those tables and say hello and shake hands and take pictures. That is what it's all about. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Great.